in many ways, most societies need a way of, 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 of their, they need some ritual that brings young men and young women into adulthood. The Maasai warriors used to kill a lion. When you were old enough to claim to be a man, you went out with the, uh, with the hunters and they found the lion and they would let the lion charge at you and your two or three claimants to be a warrior. You killed your lion, you were a man. And the mission actually serves a similar sort of process. I, I, I often meet your young missionaries in New Zealand and places like that. You know, and these, these are young men away from home for the first time. Young women too, I have to say. Well done. Well done. And night after night, they go back in tears. They know they are failures. They know they are not living up to the dreams that they had hoped to lead to. Uh, they're not meeting any targets at all, personal or presented. They feel themselves lonely, homesick, and failures. And the next day, they've got to get up and try again. And the next day, and the next day. And in the end, they have experienced so much that nothing in life ever again uh, will become so great a challenge. And that is one of the reasons why I That's one of the reasons why your community is, is so successful. And it's, it's a remarkable achievement. But I'm still not answering your question, am I? Um, <laughs> it begins with good parenting, then good teaching. And that sense that science shouldn't just be something that only the very, very cleverest people can get into. I mean, the, the, the celebrated case was Einstein, wasn't it? Who, who, who failed to get into the equivalent of graduate school but he, because his maths wasn't good enough. Um, it should be that good. <laughs> um, so I, I think we, we, we need to demystify science and we need to, to regard the scientific study of, of the world, our society, the way we live, as, as being important and natural to all of us. Uh, I have actually met some rocket scientists, <laughs> and uh, they're pretty smart people, but they're also very decent human people. More interestingly, I'm sorry, I'm really avoiding your question, aren't I? <laughs>
is making more money, has more jobs, has more opportunities, living in better houses, you know, has a better health standards than, than ever before. And each generation is doing better. Now what he's saying is there is going to be a sort of, if, if you think the norm is sort of like that, suddenly it went way up to the top. And now we are regressing down to the norm again. That's one rather disturbing thing. The second is, it's said by, by 2034, 50% of our jobs will be replaced by machines. The third thing, of course, is, it, it is that the ownership of those machines looks like being very uneven. It isn't that we will have the luxury that, that, and the, the leisure time that the ownership of this machinery will have. Right at the moment, it looks as if something like seven people have a net worth, the equivalent of the lowest 3.4 billion on the planet. The third thing is that the growth in income, or well, the growth in population, rather, we're at about 7 billion now. By the end of the century, we get to about 11 billion. 10, and the bulk of that is going to come from Africa. Why is this concerning? Because Africa does not have an ability yet, it would seem, to organize society in any sort of equitable way. The population of the world is sort of slowing down. The population of Europe is positively imploding. Uh, in order to have a stable population, we need 2.1 babies per person. We have more than that, population rises per woman. Population, if you have less than that, eventually the population will fall. Now, in Italy, they're down to something like 1.1 1 .1, uh, live birth per woman. I've seen a, a, a figure, and I cannot tell you how accurate it is, but I have seen it that suggests that the population of Italy, which is now about 47 million, drops to about 8 million Italians by the end of the century. This is a catastrophic implosion. The population of Africa, however, goes from 1.1 billion to 4.3 billion. The truth is that a country that I knew, Ethiopia, when I was a boy, in 1950, Ethiopia had a population of 18 million people. Throughout those periods when we saw famine, a uh, population of the, uh, the average Ethiopian woman was having seven babies. It's now down to 4.5 babies. By 2050, it's going to be down to 3.5, and the United Nations thinks that by the end of the century, it'll be down to 2.5, by which time the population of Ethiopia will be 243 million people. I know the country. I know the resources. I know the marvelous people. I'm here to tell you there is no way that a decent standard of living can be had in Ethiopia with a population that size. They will have to migrate. And the scale of the migration is going to cause enormous social, cultural, and probably racial conflict. Of course, you're not going to say things like that because we all live in Hollywood and it's all peace and love and all that sort of thing. Um, but the, the real truth is there are problems that no one is prepared to look at. And perhaps it is with a scientific mind uh, that we can look at things, make worst case estimates, make best case estimates, and and do what we can to try and find ways around it. We have, we have grown up believing 
that growth is a good thing and is inevitable? What if it isn't? What's our best case solution? One suggestion that I would make, for instance, would be that we manage declining numbers. In other words, we don't say, oh my god, oh my god, we've got to have more people, because otherwise our standard of doing will decline. If, as Gordon says, and if, as the proponents of artificial intelligence say, we're going to be facing real competition for jobs, then perhaps what we should be thinking of doing is, instead of adding more people looking for fewer jobs, let's try and manage the numbers of jobs that we have and match them to a declining population. We're all living longer. You know, my daughter, who is 10 now, has a reasonable chance of living a fairly active life, probably into our hundreds. Our first win, our first century. Reasonable chance of that. So perhaps one of the... I'm so far off the question. <laughs> The answer is, I don't know. <laughs> but, but I'm awfully glad that we do have science and scientific minds. And uh, I urge you all, join the Planetary Society and, um, and, and just think of that big universe out there, because that's probably where we should end up fairly soon. Take care. So, next John, uh, you seem like a great person. I loved hearing you speak. Um, I actually did serve one of those missions to Guatemala. Um, I, I chose that over killing a lion, mostly because I'm a dentist, and dentists killing lions are uh, no, no, these days. Are really <laughs> Having my hands in people's mouths all the time, I'm always worried that someone's going to bite them because it's happened before. Um, but one benefit of if it ever did get bitten off, um, I would be your twin. So, um, yeah, right there. Is that the point you were making? Okay. And, and, and I just wanted to ask, how did that happen? You weren't a dentist at one point, were you? <coughs> well, I was actually exploring one of the upper rivers of the Luababa. Valley, and um, I was with Tufty at the time, and uh, Tufty was having a bit of a tough time, you know, he, he'd lost one leg, poor fellow, and had, we had been trekking across Africa about six or seven thousand miles, but he was such a game fellow, and he, he went into the Darn River ahead of me, this crocodile, this enormous crocodile, pounced on poor old Tufty. Well, naturally, of course, a chap just can't let a, you know, a fellow Englishman sort of die like that. So I, I plunged in, fought with a crocodile for several hours. <laughs> and I, 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 I didn't get Tofty's leg back. But he was a game fellow. He said, look, he said, look, John, you go on, old boy. I mean, I, I'll catch up a bit later. I said, well, you're going to have a little bit of a problem with that, and you? you have to be legs left. And, uh, and he said, oh, don't worry about me, oh boy, you know, I'll, I'll make it, I'll make it. Game fellow. So anyway, uh, and this was a casualty of the fight with the crocodile. <laughs> and, um, uh, I, you know, I had to just shake it up a little bit just to get it through. Then I threw Tofty on, uh, on my back and walked to the next seven thousand miles. <laughs> you'll be listening to my diction and you probably know that I've just had some work on the upper gums uh, and I have a false plate in that is moving like heck so if it suddenly springs out of my mouth um, you will know it's just this temporary damn plate that the dentists have fitted and, and we hate dentists <laughs> <laughs> I'm very 
Experimental, good boy. Uh, well done. Uh, yes. Yes, hi, John. It's very nice seeing you today. Thank you yes. for the rings, man. And I know you worked in the Hobbit movies, but I wanted to ask you a question about that. In the second Hobbit movie, uh, the, the elves sees the Hobbits and the dwarves, and uh, Legolas is looking through, uh, I think it's glowing stuff, and he sees a picture of like his wife and his son. He's like, oh, who is this horrid creature? And, and Glowen says, what? That's my son, Ghibli. Was that a picture of you? <laughs> Anybody you knew? If the elves can be very cavalier in their uh, assessment of dwarvish beauty. <laughs> As, as many of will you, uh, many men will have explained to you, God and said, the truth is a kiss without a moustache is like beef without mustard. <laughs> <laughs> well, the dwarvish beauty, with those long beards, and thick, luscious hair, and like those scabby looking creatures that you saw in The Hobbit. <laughs> Dear me, dear me, half the makeup and half the good looks. <laughs> um, yes, yes. Uh, what was the question again? I see. <laughs> but uh, the truth, the truth of the matter is that um, you know, young Legolas needed to meet the world and meet the true glory of dwarfdom before he actually understood life. <laughs> Extreme. 
extraordinary fantasy book uh, called Lord of the Rings. The probability of it coming out of New Zealand was negative. There was no tradition of filmmaking in New Zealand other than Peter Jackson's rather small movies. You know, anyone can actually make a movie. You take four actors, or six actors, write a suit story, any one of you can make a movie. But when you've got 21 principal characters, when you've got at least 14 months of principal photography, when you have, on some days, 1,200, 1,400, 1,600 extras with horses and wranglers and trailers for the horses, and drivers for the trailers. You know, uh, how do you feel? What happens when, when we go down to Christchurch and it's raining a bit, and here is the production office, and here is the center of Christchurch. There are three miles of road between the two. And then it starts raining. When I say starts raining, it doesn't stop. The rain actually washes out 11 houses up there and the road right between there and there. Now we have a 19 mile track, single way, connecting the production office and the actors. As it happens, the actors have got their own problems. Um, well, how can I put it this way? It's the only time I've had the hat to climb up a step ladder in order to get into my hotel room. <laughs> Because the entire bottom floor of the hotel was um, flooded. And, and, and then, of course, the call sheet went out. There will be no filming tomorrow as the lake is underwater. <laughs> now, this is a moment that separates real filmmakers from the also ran. Because once you get behind on a project of this scale, you never get out of it. You start losing a day or two here, a week or two there, you lose a month, and spirits fall, and the money begins to dry up, and it all comes to a sad end. That call sheet that came out said, there will be no filming tomorrow because the lake is underwater. The following day, all of us went off to a different part of New Zealand. And you have to understand, this is not the New Zealand that you go to now that's full of motels and hotels and newly built tourist areas. You know, this is remote New Zealand that's never had really much tourism at all. And within one day, two or three hundred members of the crew and cast and actors are rehabilitated. And the following day, we start work again. And we go back to Christchurch about six months later. The, when you're making a major film, it is a logistical exercise as complicated as that as moving a small army. And that's the real genius of Peter Jackson. He was not only a great filmmaker, but he put the team together that actually could solve the problems. Everyone should work in the film industry at least, at least some of the time. Why? Because we are not interested in your reasons why you cannot do something. We're not interested. 
Now, there's a problem, what's the solution? And as my friend Stephen said at dinner last night, Stephen, if you're here, um, uh, not only one solution, but we want two or three solutions. And uh, that's the job. If the director says to you, Gil, I'm shooting this way, up lunch, and you see that funny little mound in the background over there, about 100 yards away, I want two zebra there. There is no point in saying to him, Sir, we are in the middle of the Caribbean and there is not a zebra to be had for 3,000 miles. You say, right up. And at lunchtime you go out and if you can, you hire, and if you have to, buy two small donkeys <laughs> and paint them. <laughs> So that after lunch, you can go up to the director and say, well, sir, sir, I've, got the, uh, I've got the zebra for you in the background. And he'll go, zebra? Oh, yes. Uh, oh, that, that was a stupid idea. Anyway, I'm shooting that way, and I... And that's filming. <laughs> banter between Gimli and Legolas during the entire trilogy is one of the funniest things that any of us have ever seen. My question is, behind the scenes and during the filming, uh, what, was there more to the banter? Did you guys go off script? Did you guys do pranks on each other? <laughs> this is almost a variant of the the one that I always used to get from shy girls immediately the film came out. Did you and Orly hang out a lot together? <laughs> um, the truth was, he was 19, I was 55. <laughs> if we had been hanging out together, what a. Um, uh, they were a marvelous cast. They were so full of energy. And, and life, and there was only one miserable son of a bitch on that show. And, and unfortunately, I wore his boots every day. <laughs> you have to understand that the, the makeup was fine. There was nothing wrong with the makeup, it was the person underneath it. It's, we were using medical and medical disease is hypoallergenic. Well, you don't react to it, but you're not meant to take it off on a daily basis because it really bonds to the cells of the skin. The more you take it off, the more the cells of the skin that you take off. And so I lost all, all the skin around my eyes like that. And it was just, Red, wet, lymph. And of course, when you do that, you get a, you get inflammation setting into the face and swells. I looked hideous. Uh, and um, it was not the happiest of experiences, let me tell you. I, I didn't want to go out. I, when I looked at myself in the mirror, you know, I was, I, I thought, oh God, it looks awful. Uh, more so than normal, you know, but uh, it, it, it was a, a really bad experience. And added to which, I was the tallest member in those days of the, of, of, of the fellowship. So it was very hard when we were doing reverse shots and I would have to get down like this. <laughs> and, and they'd say, lower, lower. You know, you can't actually get much lower than that. But to give people a proper eye line. So in it, then they started using one of my three doubles who were, you know, midgets and pretty small anyway. Um, added to which, makeup for me was generally an eight hour experience during the course of the day. A basic five-hour put-off, and then sit rounds, and if 
anything creased or crinkled, then it was another hour in the fixing. So, rapidly it became a, a business of doing some of the scenes uh, that we could do and had to do together. But often, you know, I would wait for them to go home at the end of the day, and then, and then I would do my bit. And, and Peter would say, okay, okay, that's what we've got that now, so, all right, John, I'm gonna cut you loose now. And I would start improvising and banting, and, you know, if I heard him giggle, I knew it would make at least the first cut of the film. <laughs> um, they were marvelous. They were such delightful young men, and, and, and they had a lot of fun together. And it was not their fault that I wasn't part of that fun. Um, it, you, you know, it was fine at the beginning, but you, you know, you end up having to separate yourself because you can't be there fooling around too much because it means that the makeup gets messed up. And it is a huge prosthetic thing. You'll notice that the, the dwarves in, in The Hobbit had virtually no makeup on the tour. They just had a tiny little bit. Um, and that was one of the lessons they learned from, uh, from Gimli. Keep the minimum makeup on because it just takes too much time. I mean, even so, Peter Jackson did say on the premiere, he said that he knew perfectly well why Walt Disney had chosen to have no more than seven dwarfs. <laughs> because 13 were just a handful. Yes. <laughs> anyway, sorry, next one. <laughs> Thanks, you. Woo! Sorry, so you're actually going kind to of touch on this a lot, but um, anyone who's seen the movies, and especially those who have read the Lord of the Rings books, know that Gimli and Legolas form a really close friendship by the end of that story. And so I was wondering if there's anyone in the cast that you felt you formed a really strong friendship with as a result of making that movie. Actors generally form <laughs> real bonds with each other. Um, I was I was particularly impressed by Vigo. Uh, who is an extraordinary man. Vigo is one of those unusual creatures who could actually earn his keep as a commercial or art photographer. He is a very, very good painter. Uh, you remember that film he did with um, Michael Douglas? It was a three-hander, Michael Douglas. Uh, and he was basically the woman's lover. And uh, Douglas finds out and employs him to try and murder his wife. Um, there's a scene in it where Vigo is playing an artist. You, there's a shot, a shot in, his, uh, in his studio. All the pictures in that studio were painted by Vigo. He is a really considerable graphic artist. I mean, a painter, a portrait. He's also not a bad poet. He's also got a very eclectic sort of mind. And uh, I always found that talking to Vigo, you know, he was really bright and really sharp. And of course, a studio would hate somebody like Vigo because what you want is an actor who will consistently be a star, you know, who will only pick starring vehicles and who will make you mega bucks. But you see, somebody like Vigo, is not really primarily interested in the money. He's interested in the journey. He's interested in the experience. You show him a script that he likes with no funding, but with very limited audience interest. That's what he wants to do. He doesn't want us, you know, sit around for two years waiting for Superman or something equally absurd like that. Uh, I, did I say that? I didn't mean that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, um, you know, a, a 
this that some, some of the young hobbits um, are such bright fellows. Uh, young Pippin, for instance, is, is a very skilled bookbinder. I bet you didn't know that. He is pretty much a master craftsman for rebinding old books in leather and tooling them and things like that. Uh, I've always sort of been rather more interested in actors who had a world outside acting than, you know, than actors whose whole world was acting. Um, but each of them had a Sean Astor, the future president of the United States. <laughs> I, I said that. Um, I mean, they were all individual and wonderful and worked well together. And it was a real joy to know. I just wish I had spent more time with them. It just, it just wasn't possible. Sorry, there's a long answer, big one. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, first off, followed you for a long time and being on behalf of everyone here, thank you for coming. And second off, we've heard a lot of actors tonight talk about different things that they've ended up taking with them on accident from the set. Is there anything to follow you? Um, I did get given my axe. Uh, one of them. Um, and I do have a hall of shame in which the trophies of 50 years of misspent acting uh, are, are displayed. Um, but, you know, it's... An actor is a work in progress. You know, I, I just, the, the real thing that I take from being Lord of the Rings was the chance of meeting so many marvelous fans and, 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 and just some good memories from some good people that you take into the next show that you do. It may not be as big as Lord of the Rings, it may be small. The great thing about being an actor is, is the community of, 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 of filmmakers and filmmaking. You learn far more you know, from your fellow actors and from the guys working on the set than you can ever imagine. And uh, that's the real trophy that you take away. Uh, something, sometimes it's, it's tangible like a hat from Raiders of the Lost Ark or something like that. <laughs> but the real memories are, the real thing you take away are like your memories and the jokes and the laughter and the idiosyncrasies. That's, that's the real memorabilia. Anyway, to make films there and, and 
to, in a way, assert our solidarity with them, I suppose. And I must avoid politics. Oh, God, avoid politics. <laughs> uh, but wonderful people. And uh, it was an extraordinary experience. It, it's always an hour-long show. And I think we did it in 10 days or 11 days. And it was 12 days. But it was a very, very short time. Um, and it was a wonderful experience. I, now, I better not talk about my six months recent experience, which was a complete waste of time. I mustn't talk about that. No, no, no. I mustn't do that. But anyway, sometimes it is a contrast to do a short, beautifully written, beautifully planned, beautifully directed, beautifully edited piece like that that just comes from Tolstoy, comes from the the heart of the great Russian soul in you know in 1885 or something like this. It's it was a, it's a glorious piece and. Uh, I was so lucky to be involved in it. Loved it. I urge you all to look at it because um, it's it's about it, it's about redemption in a way. It's an old man who's lost faith in everything and finally gets it back and uh, comes to life again. Um, so um, what will that do? Thank you. quoted in court and used against me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sliders is uh, something that I'm still annoyed about. <laughs> I'm partly annoyed because I didn't handle it well enough. Um, but largely because it was such a waste of an opportunity. That show could still be on the air. That show could actually have been uh, the equal of Star Trek. And that's saying something, because I love Star Trek. I, I'm a real Trekkie myself. It's just that we did not seem to have writers who understood anything about science, <coughs> let alone science fiction. Well, they hadn't read any science fiction anyway. Um, and and uh, you know, every show became a, their reduction or redaction of Night of the Living Dead, the island of Dr. Moreau. Uh, they even used the same masks for that one. Uh, you know, Twister. Tremors, you name it, we did our own TV version of it. Uh, for me, it was that moment I walked into the, the writer's building and saw them standing around the, uh, watching the screen because Species had just been released on DVD. You know, they were saying, well, now we could take that scene and we could give them that the one, that one there, and then we could go to the scene there. You know, I worked with real writers, uh, and it just seemed to me that that sort of cheap plagiarism was cheating the audience. It could have been the best show to Think about it. You can go anywhere in space and anywhere in time, uh, and, and all they can do is come up with other people's ideas. That's not to say that you can't take somebody else's idea and write a completely different story about it. You know, we, we're all accustomed to the story of, of the mutiny on the bounty. You know, it's the brave-hearted Fletcher Christian who is the hero against the savage tyrant uh, of, 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 uh, of a captain. 
Well, and of course, those who actually know the story know it's the, absolutely the other way. That Bly was one of the three greatest navigators of the Southern Ocean. And his career was destroyed by the selfish, weak man, Fletcher Christian, who, within 18 months of landing his group of mutineers on Pitcairn, every single one of them were dead. You know, there's always a different way, different stories. Now, incidentally, by the way, Fletcher Christian had sailed with Bly before. He knew exactly what it was about and, and how it would go. He just was a weak man. Um, anyway, I beg your pardon, it's a bit off the question there, isn't it? <laughs> All I can say is that working with my fellow sliders was one of the great joys of my life. We worked together so well, they were all marvels. And it broke my heart that we, you know, the, the show was sinking so fast that, um, you know, I, I, I did my level best to get fired. It's very hard to get fired in Hollywood. Because they think you know something they don't, you see. He wants to get fired. What does he know? Has he got a better show to go to? Has he, has he got off in a bigger film? Something like that? We're not letting him go! <laughs> but uh, I love them all, and they were, they were great guys. And it would be lovely to have just gone back and done six or seven real good <coughs> original stories. But that's an opportunity for Anyway, this uh, time is up, it says. The time is up. I want to thank you all. Everybody, John.